Good evening. Welcome to the University of London Institute in Paris live event, How Do New Worlds Come Into Print? This event is part of the National Being Human Festival of the Humanities, which is taking place across the UK between 12th and 22nd of November. Our contribution to this festival from Paris is, as always, a transnational undertaking. And for the theme this year, which is New Worlds, we're going to be exploring with you a few times and places that are really important for research and learning that we are engaged in at the University of London Institute in Paris. Times and places where we think we see the premises of a new world in the making. Being Human is the only national festival of the, festival of the humanities run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. Events are mostly online this year, and you can see the full program online at beinghumanfestival.org. The festival can be found at Being Human Fest on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and the hashtag is beinghuman2020. Please help us keep as many festival events as possible free and to improve the festival in years coming by filling out the feedback survey that we'll make available at the end of this evening's event. Your feedback is really, really valuable. And finally, if you would like to support by making a donation, you can do so by going to the beinghumanfestival.org page. And we'd like to thank you very much for your attention this evening and for joining us. I'm now going to join you more, more physically and show you the, uh, my colleagues I have with me this evening. My name is Anna Louise Milne, and I'm joined by Dr. Eugene Brennan and Dr. Uh, Joanne Bruton, two colleagues from the Institute here um, who will be sharing their own work this evening um, as, we, uh, as we develop this, this, this event and this exploration that we're imagining as a north-south exploration of places where new worlds come into print. Now, we had originally planned a two-phase event in the convivial surroundings of our Institute in Paris, but as I tune in from the Institute near the Invalides on this warm November evening, I'm more or less the only person in the building and the streets outside are empty. And though I very much regret the directly living and breathing interactions that we had hoped to instigate, I'm also very conscious that these exceptional circumstances that we are living in our respective places and according to the restrictions most immediately impinging on each one of us, that these, this, these circumstances connect very significantly with the questions that we want to explore tonight with you. Although there is no simple parallel to any of the cultural scenes that we will be revisiting tonight, the fact that bookshops are as good as closed, as are all libraries and museums and universities, that classes and conversations and friendships are all happening remotely through a handful of online platforms, and that to cross the city this evening, I may be stopped by the police and required to show an authorization. All these situations are all aspects of the present moment that resonate particularly with the place where we'll be starting tonight, still in Paris, but almost exactly 80 years ago, during the, the early years of the Nazi occupation of Paris. But before I get to that and move us back 80 years into another dark, November or December night in Paris. I want to just go back and, and, and introduce my colleagues a little bit more properly. So Dr. Eugene Brennan, a lecturer in the international politics at ULIT, and Dr. Joanne Bruton, a lecturer in French cultural studies. And I'm also delighted to say that we'll have a contribution from Dr. Bakary Saar from the Cheikh Anta Diop University of Dakar, Senegal. And together we're going to move, move between new novels and clandestine poetry, music journalism, to new voices in Morocco and new print forms in Senegal. We'll be inviting you to raise any questions you have about these different scenes via the chat box. And towards the end of the event, we'll also make it possible for you to come in in an audio mode. Um, and we'd like to really invite you to think about the experiences you have of having sought out new ways to make your world come into some sort of stable, shareable form, some sort of expression or language, or perhaps a rerouting of media to open up new horizons of meaning in a world increasingly saturated by mass market images and non-stop news feeds. And also to think about where you have felt a new world being offered to you, through what forms, what innovations in books, in patterns of expressions, what minority languages and perhaps how they have marked out their presences, even through translation. In these days of endless boxes on screens, 
we are going to try this evening to get back in touch with some of the pleasure of a weight in the hand of a book, of the feel of paper, of the shape of characters on the cover of a book or a magazine, of the experience of excitement at opening a new issue or of buying a new book that make, feeling the, that make the world feel alive and urgent again for us. And then having done that, we'll also hope to share some small fragments of a more directly interactive work, more directly interactive project that we've been leading, partly under with the support of the Being Human Festival, which is um, a very artisanal book making project. I have a few examples here, which I can show you. So this is work that we've been carrying out with Being Human, and it's work that we would have liked to be able to share very directly with you this evening, but I'm gonna have to hold the book myself and try and make it come alive for you via the screen. These are books that are made by, with, by young people who are currently seeking asylum in Paris, and we're going to be asking towards the end of this event what it might mean for people today deprived of rights and often abandoned to the street to envisage a new world by the making of a book. But at first, as the light is going out around me in this city, I want us to go back to 1940, to December 1940, in fact, where the first of the clandestine broadsheets, a single leaf of paper, was published by what was known as the Musée de l'Homme Network. And I'm going to start by showing a few images of this as well. Um, so I'm going to go back to this. Okay, 1940s and the Musée de l'Homme network. Not exactly what you've got in your screen here, but nonetheless, I'm going to start by presenting them a little bit more. A group of intellectuals that gathered around the French Ethnography Museum, the Musée de l'Homme, which is just a short walk away from here. The sheet that they published in December 1940 was entitled Résistance, and it signed the beginning of the intellectual resistance, which would become a multi-form movement that operated at the frontier between visibility and invisibility, close to the armed resistance with its close links to the French Communist Party, but also significantly independent and attached, very much attached to the primacy of literary expression as a vehicle, as a vehicle for freedom. And as one of its prime movers would also say, as a vehicle for madness, madness in the face of the terrible oppression of the Nazi occupation. And then also equally important, I think, Literary expression as a vehicle for some of the small everyday things that make up the stuff of life. The Musée de l'Homme network was denounced and no trace of the first printed expression of résistance remains. And the men behind it, some of whom were leading social scientists at the time, were executed in May 1941. But other publications followed and what one critic has called a slow rumble started to come from all directions. At a time when people didn't know what to do, what to think, where to turn, what the future held, poetry filled that space, and um, filled that space sometimes through semi-clandestine publications, which, then, which were then in turn openly displayed in bookshops, such as Aragon's famous poem, Liberté, or the volumes that you can see here that Paul Seguers published from his home near Avignon, Poésie 40, Poésie 41, Poésie et Vérité, and so on. And others, much more dangerously still, including Les Lettres Françaises, which you have here. This is the first issue of Les Lettres Françaises, rather poorly reproduced here, I'm afraid, published in September 1942. Okay, a very, a few handset pages with articles that both settled scores in the French literary world with writers that who had gone over to the collaboration, but also set a, a, a radical new agenda for literary renewal and resistance. When the first issue that you're looking at here, which you can see was largely put together by hand writing onto the page, um, when this first issue finally came out, printed under the cover of night, its founder, the Jacques de Cour, a German high school teacher and a member of the Communist Party, was already dead, executed by the Nazis in May 1942. So it took from that time when he was imagining the beginning of this project and trying to build the network which would lead to the Comité National des Écrivains, the National Committee of Writers, which was the, the committee that was behind these Lettres Françaises, these French letters. Uh, Jacques de Croix was imagining that all through the early spring of 1942, and it took until September 1942 to make it visible in the form of this small broadsheet. 
Now, the Lettre Française would go on to be the main regular press organ of the intellectual resistance. You have the, light, the later versions here from 1944, and on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the name of Jacques Decour there, the founder of the Lettre Française. It graduated from the very rudimentary setting of the first issues to a more respectable publication and survived right through till the end of the war, serving as a rallying point for writers in both Vichy France and the, uh, the occupied zone in the north. While in parallel to this and the Lettre Française and also you know, drawing very much from the kind of gathering of intellectuals that were the Lettre Française enabled, uh, two other men very quick to rally the resistance as well, Pierre de Lescure and Jean Brûleur, who would later be known as Vercor from the rocky remote area of France where the resistance had bunkered down, they also held good on their ambition to launch what would become the famous Édition de Minuit, the Midnight Editions. And in February 1942, the first title appeared with just 350 copies of Le Silence de la Mer, one of the most famous texts of the occupation, The Silence of the Sea, a clarion call to keep silent when faced with the enemy. And as Jean Paulon would later say, Jean Paulo, a key figure as well in the creation of the Lettre Française, as he would later say in February 1944, what happened in the war was that the weight of language changed. It took on new consequence. It became a matter of life and death. In that sense, writers lost language under the occupation and they had to find it again on a new basis. And the Édition de Minuit was one version of that refounding of the means of speaking freely. Its commitment to a pared down, elegant, I think I have a copy, oh, no, this is the wrong one. A pared down, elegant uh, aesthetic, uh, and, and also the quality of the paper on which they put great store, you know, despite the incredible deprivations of the day, signified its commitment to its independence, its gamble on the future, on the way that these texts would remain beyond the immediate devastation of the war. And despite a difficult transition from wartime conditions, they did remain, and the Édition de Minuit went on to become a defining presence in the French literary landscape. The motor of the new novel, the publisher of Beckett, Genie, and later the press that came out most significantly in favor of insubordination in the context of the Algerian war. Now, before I hand over, to my colleague Eugene for a, a different sort of countercultural scene and different sort of countercultural determination. And I'm going to be very interested to see what sort of connections we can build between a later scene of, deter of countercultural determination. I want to try just very briefly to get really close to what the printing of these now iconic landmarks in intellectual history actually involved. Because what did it take to bring out Le Silence de la Mer and to bring it into print? The very first printer that Le Sueur and Brûleur approached was a man called Ollard. He was quite a famous printer at the time, and you can see him on the left-hand side of the screen here. And he would ultimately print a lot of the Minuit titles. You can see him with his boxes of lead characters and the paper, and they printed, he and his key and his, and his main worker, printed through the night um, in order to bring out the volumes, these small volumes that you can see on the right-hand side of the page. But for the very first edition, of the silence de la mer, Ollard was concerned that there would be too many, there was too much danger, there was there too much possibility that one of his workers in his workshop would leak this rather strange kind of um, underground activity. So he in fact suggested that Le Sueur and Brûleur should approach a man called Claude Udeville, who worked right under the nose of the Gestapo on the boulevard de l'Hôpital, um, very close to the Jardin des Plantes. Now, Oudeville's business was in fact printing cards to announce a bereavement, hence his situation right across the street from a hospital. But Oudeville worked alone on Le Silence de la Mer, using the characters and the paper that Ollard supplied on a day-by-day -day basis. He printed eight pages at a time, always at night, and it took two months to set and print the volume. And that was only the first stage, because then it had to be stitched. And that job, of course, fell to a number of women, including Yvonne Paraf, whose flat above the Trocadero became the storage depot for the Édition de Minuit, and who delivered the volumes around the city in her car, risking herself to torture at the hands of the Nazis on each trip. It took 15 days to stitch the pages of the 350 volumes of Vercors' novel, and Vercors himself stuck the covers on. The work was fastidious and repetitive, and of utmost significance, 
And I hope I've managed to make it feel a little bit real as it does to me as I sit here in this dark Paris night in the silence of this city. Now I'm gonna put my camera back on and hand over to my colleague Eugene to bring some other sounds and colors into the space. Over to you, Eugene. Thanks very much, um, Anna Louise. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, tradition of music journalism, which is quite different from the kind of life and death matters that Anna Louise has been discussing, but I think has a lot of crossovers in terms of um, creating new worlds via print in certain conditions of constraints and within certain parameters. Um, so my relationship to this kind of topic is kind of personal because I'm an academic who works on critical theory at the University of London in Paris. Uh, but I came to critical theory and kind of exciting critical ideas, not only through university seminar spaces and academic journals, but through popular music magazines. And I find something quite exciting about that, um, that sort of democratic possibility of unsettling the boundaries between high culture and low culture. Mm -hmm. So what I want to speak about right now is to maybe give a bit of an historical overview of this um this tradition of countercultural music writing that took place in the mainstream music press and then give one or two specific instances of it of it um particularly in relationship to afrofuturism one particularly interesting set of ideas that came uh, uh from this tradition so as i mentioned the tradition dates from um kind of the the 60s counterculture really and it's informed by the idea of of a kind of a popular modernism so if modernism was this, you know, informed by aesthetic and artistic ambition, but had certain kind of elitist connotations, a popular moder modernism is trying to aim for the same aesthetic ambition, but with a sense of democratic conclusion or a, a wider sense of democratic inclusion, I should say. Um, so I'll go straight to my slides and give a few images to start off. Um, If you can see the slide on the screen at the moment, it's a collection of some of my own music magazines, uh, The Wire from the moment. Um, but I'm really gonna go a little bit further back now, as I said, to the late 60s, to kind of look at the origins of this music writing tradition. Because it kind of originated around rock music, music writing around um, rock and roll, which at its basis is was generally anti-intellectual. Um, rock music kind of reinforced gender norms tended to be quite macho and was often musically simplistic as well, often based on the, kind of the same three chord patterns. Uh, but this began to change in the late 1960s from about the time of the Beatles' more sort of experimental turn with albums like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Bands. Rock music was increasingly thinking of itself as an art form. It was developing a more intellectual conception of itself. So in response to rock's changing conception of itself, which was not only more intellectual, but more psychedelic, more adventurous, music journalism was in this position of, of being potentially outmoded, outdated, failing really to live up to the music it was supposed to be writing about. So in the early 1970s, to try and address this, um, the NME magazine, the New Musical Express, hired a new wave of writers from the underground press writers who had been kind of involved in independent underground magazines in the 60s, who were influenced by the beat poets, by psychedelia and other kind of countercultural currents, to go into the mainstream press and kind of shake things up, particularly at the NME. One of these writers was Charles Char Murray, who said at the time that part of his brief when he was hired, um, as inherited from the underground press, was to broaden the palette of cultural influence and turn people onto things they might not otherwise encounter. So this summarizes how the music press was less narrowly focused on the music in itself and instead encompassing all kinds of cultural discovery. It began to function as a kind of a gateway drug to new cultural worlds. Readers pulled in for record reviews of their favorite bands, might find themselves chasing up uh, references to French philosophy, European modernism or radical politics. One of my favorite journalists in this tradition, Paul Morley, describes the press as a kind of crucial platform for unexpected encounters. He recounts how the enemy was a kind of extraordinary tunnel you could crawl through every Thursday morning when it came out. A new set of po possibilities seemed to open up. It was almost psychedelic, he said. So this kind of taste for experiments and cultural world building, gathering momentum in the music press uh, in the 70s was reflected in the music of David Bowie. 
where rock music was often about authenticity and a kind of attachment to roots, Bowie celebrated the pleasures of artifice, of reinventing oneself from one moment to the next. As with each album during this period, he constructed entirely new personalities and fictional universes. Similarly, the music press was celebrating reinvention and even the pleasures of pretentiousness. So pretentiousness, we know, has sometimes negative connotations. It's sometimes a critique. But I think ultimately interesting art always involves some level of pretense, of experimenting with different identities, showing the constructed nature of identity in the first place, and the thrill of cosplaying and play acting. So this line of thinking um, and the, this kind of tradition I'm describing was really consolidated then in the post-punk period at the NMA. So post-punk is kind of generally covers the late 70s and early 1980s. Um, and if punk music was characterized by, let's say, a kind of angry attitude and a, a, a musical simplicity as well, a kind of emphasis on sort of three chords and the, thru the, and the truth, as the slogan goes, post-punk was... Um, was more aims towards cultivating atmosphere and complexity and more intellectual ambition as well. So in this cultural context, music journalism at the NME got even more ambitious. It started to bring in more references from French philosophy and other kind of avant-garde art forms. Um, the historian of the NME, uh, you'll see in your screen right now, the history of the NME, uh, written by Pat Long, wrote about how the NME began to resemble um, a kind of philosophy department at a provincial university. French philosophical concepts were increasingly used to write about the music press, but not necessarily in a conventionally academic way, because they weren't really used to explain things or abstractly intellectualize, but rather to try and convey some of the energy of the music itself. I think this is quite significant because the task of, of what journalism is supposed to do is normally to explain things to the reader, to contextualize and evaluate a piece of artwork. But these writers were more interested in decontextualizing, in celebrating the thrills of unruly energy and all the kind of chaos of the music itself. So um, Morley, Paul Morley, who I mentioned, has one kind of interesting uh, um, formulation of this, uh, an article from the time he writes, about going to visit the, the post-punk group Cabaret Voltaire in Sheffield. And he opens the article by saying, I am on a journey to demystify and mythologize. So it kind of sums up the contradictory role of the critic, that on the one hand, the critic is trying to demystify the conditions of music production, to say something true about what it's like to produce music under capitalism, to say a kind of political truth, but not at the expense of um, spoiling the mystery to be able to kind of participate in the mystery and mythology at the same time. So that for me um, encapsulates uh, um, what was kind of innovative about this tradition of music writing, that it was not just kind of a negative sense of critique, but a kind of creative criticism of world building going on at the same time, of participating and intensifying the very scenes they're trying to, to get across to the reader. So by way of conclusion, I'm going to jump forward to the 1990s and um, give a few more specific examples of uh, these sorts of critical tensions. Um, I'm going to conclude if I've, I'm conscious of kind of speaking for too long already, but I've got a few more minutes left. So I'm going to say a little bit about Afrofuturism, which was um, which really emerged out of this tradition into into the 90s. And um, Afrofuturism was basically a a set of cultural trends that had been around for a very long time, but only really came into prominence in, in critical discourse in the 90s. And it was based on the connections between science fiction and the experience and history of black and Afro-diasporic peoples. So the idea was that science fiction stories based on alienation, planetary displacements, all these kind of far-fetched scenarios kind of happens on a certain level. If you think of the Middle Passage, the transatlantic slave trade, the transportation of entire populations across the Atlantic Ocean for enslavement, you can't really get much more science fiction and far-fetched than that. And similarly, the afterlives of slavery, the kind of ongoing existence of racism, particularly in America, where it's 
being described by black writers like Ishmael Reed as kind of one experience for white people and quite a different one for black people intensifies this ongoing sense of alienation that Reed talks about how black people live the estrangement science fiction writers describe. So what you see in your screens right now is a, an article that really brilliantly sums up a lot of these ideas and kind of takes them to a, a new pitch in the mid 1990s. It's an article from Ian Penman called Black Secret Tricknology. And it's about the uh, musician Tricky's debut album, Max and K. Um, Penman celebrated these Afrofuturist ideas in, um, in his review of Tricky's album. And what he talks about is how Trick Tricky's music plays upon this tradition of using your exclusion or marginalization to your advantage, of turning it into a kind of weapon. So alienation is something that we often, you know, in critical discourse, it's sometimes something to be kind of fought against and, and, and cured from. And what Afrofuturists say is, well, let's use alienation to our advantage. Let's create possibility out of constraints. Let's turn a dystopic history into a utopic possibility. Um, and I think the constellation of these ideas kind of comes together in this quote I wanted to read to conclude, which is um, Henman kind of summing up this Afrofuturist tradition that, that informs Tricky's album. And he, he writes that, if you see in the screens right now, this other tradition has always been sometimes bitterly suffused with an inherent, sometimes crippling sense of doubt doubt that any public pronouncement of oppositionality had any real points and that you rather had to find or reclaim a language of your own in codes is murky stellar from out of the sky or earth where you found yourself from out of myriad discredited past or future in the 60s and 70s sci-fi shaman like miles sly stone and george clinton chose this option if we're going to be consigned to society's margins anyway then why not speak in a marginal tongue speak a language which people would have to come to on your terms, not theirs. So just to conclude, I'll kind of come back on screen. Um, so a little bit of what I wanted to say in kind of recounting this tradition is that it was really kind of crystallized around Afrofuturist ideas. Um, and this came about in the 1990s at the very moment when there was the threat of the internet all kinds of economic threats that make it more and more difficult for, for um, adventurous publishing to, to persist in a, in a mass marketplace where we've seen kind of dwindling sales for these sorts of newspapers. But at the same time, you get this kind of a really adventurous utopian discourse developed around Afrofuturism, which, which tries to think about how to, to create possibility from constraints in different sorts of ways and tries to say something about the contradictory role of the critic in journalism, the critic who is supposed to comment and explain, but at the same time has these ambitions to produce concepts and to build um, cultural worlds, be part of the scenes they're describing at the same time. So yeah, I guess I'll conclude there for the moment and I'll pass it over to Joanne. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, I, think, I think these ideas around Afrofuturism and and the mobilization of estrangement and displacement and, and, and kind of using marginal tongues as a form of, of kind of radical resistance and freedom um, really do kind of intersect with some of the ideas I'm looking at today. But perhaps thinking of the idea of the margin and taking it to a kind of the geographic liminal um, in the space of, of Tangiers, uh, the port of Tangiers at this uh, opening of the Mediterranean. Um, and I'm going to try and think through some of the ways in which the narratives that are seeped into the Mediterranean, the incredibly problematic narratives, how we might use those stories as a form of, of hope and optimism of kind of European and Arabic cultural dialogue. So I'll go straight to the PowerPoint, I think. And I will start. <clears throat> so this is the Librairie des Colonnes. And it's nestled inconspicuously on the Boulevard Pasteur in Tangiers, just behind the port where the Mediterranean meets the Atlantic Ocean. I'm going to show you uh, the map here so that you've got that in your, in your sights. This cult bookshop was once the seat of 20th century experimentation, where the beat poets like Paul Bowles, Jack Kerouac, William Burroughs, French absurdists like Samuel Beckett and Jean Genet, post-independence Moroccan revolutionaries like Mohamed Shukri, 
and to Har Benjaloon went to seek refuge in a shared cultural space where the heady cosmopolitanism of the Tangiers International Zone brought Europe to North Africa through a more liberal set of dynamics than the former abuses of colonial rule. Now, ensconced in the labyrinthine streets of Tangiers, the bookshop bears witness to a different dream of inclusion. It is a spectator to the current drama of the Mediterranean, whose migrant boats traffic bodies across the Forbidden Sea, where borders are patrolled by drones who keep out those who are mired in poverty and destitution and welcome those tourists who promise capital gain. The imprints of so many who leave from Tangiers, just behind the Librairie des Colonnes, are erased by that journey. And yet this bookshop is conceived of its own sort of life raft. Director Simone Pierre Amelin tells us in an interview in 2018, and this is a slightly long-winded story, but I promise there's, a, there's a, a, a thread that joins it together. He tells us in this interview that he inherited the bookshop from his ancestors and that his nautical great-grandfather, Ferdinand Amelin, who was captain of the ship L'Hermione, which in 1780 allowed Lafayette to join the American insurgents in the fight for their independence. So L'Hermione is currently, through the international organization of La Francophonie, um, a, sh a boat with only uh, young people from across the Francophone world on. And they've embarked on a four month expedition around the Atlantic. And in the library on board the ship, exactly where the cannonball used to be fired from in the 18th century, Amelin has placed the bookshop's literary review, Nejma. It's as though this, this literary review has a presence that's in some way bellicose, insurgent, fighting back against the erasure of the stories that travel across the Mediterranean, acting like a kind of cultural bridge between Arab and European worlds. Amelin tells us that les gens de mer et les gens de lettres sont tous les deux humanistes. So seafaring and literary types are both humanist. And I want to argue that this literary review, Nejma, whose title is inspired by the great Algerian writer Kateb Yassin and the 1956 novel about Franco-Algerian colonial love, a title that means star in Arabic. So this literary review looks to the printed word as a kind of leading light that leads towards new collaborative horizons, or a kind of paper boat, if you like, that ferries Franco-Moroccan narratives from one border to another. How possible is it really, though, for a literary review, just for a static piece of print, to traverse the Mediterranean as a space of possibility and a, and a disruption of kind of fixed binaries and power structures and assumptions? So to kind of try to answer that, let's pull back in time to the 2011 edition of Nijma to explore how that hybridity is consecrated and yet still remains so fragile. So here's the 2011 edition of Nejma and the title Jean Genet un Saint Marocain, uh, Jean Genet, a Moroccan saint. Now in 2018, I visited the Librairie des Colonnes when I was en route to the burial site of the iconic um, French, uh, iconoclastic French writer Jean Genet, um, enfant terrible of French literature, anti-colonial militant and Arabophile, in the town of Larache, an hour outside of Tangiers. As you can see here, his liminal tomb sits in a Christian cemetery contiguous to a Muslim one, abjectly next to a prison and a landfill site, facing the North Atlantic poised halfway between Europe and Africa. His marginal posture, um, defiantly rejecting the metropole that his texts have always strived to, I quote, more than hate, but to, I quote, vomit out. Now, Genet was a writer in perennial exile who disidentified with the yoke of any national identity. Yet the poetic imprint made by his mud tomb on the coast in La Hache leaves a permanent mark in the Moroccan landscape that's reappropriated by their cultural myths and printing presses. Genet's marginal tongue, to reuse the terms we just heard, becomes a site for a new idiolect, idios to mean individual, so a kind of individual language style, that I want to argue kind of optimistically brings two cultures, French and Moroccan, European and Arabic, into dialogue. In 1986, the Moroccan philosopher Abdel Kebir Katibi called for the canonization of Genet à la Marocaine in the Moroccan way, calling him Sidi Gini, or Saint Genet. 
in what he called an act of theatre, where on top of his tomb, a marabou, or large canonical tent, would be built, and facing the Atlantic, through the way his sentences are read, through the rhythm of an oceanic phrase, his voice, replete with the semiotics of fluidity, performance, and oscillation that we associate with it, would become part of Moroccan spiritual culture. And it was on these travels that I picked up the 2011 copy of Nejma, where this beatification was formalized in print. Jean Genet, a Moroccan saint. Writer, I'll just show you the, uh, the cover again there. Writer and activist, a Moroccan writer and activist, Abdel Taïa, recalls the transcendence of Genet's narrative via his illiterate mother. And in the rewriting, seems to ascribe this poetic French heritage to his Moroccan culture. I'm going to just do a slightly long quotation here so I can talk you through it. Jean Genet, since the beginning, since he saw Tangiers for the first time in the 30s, is back home, living, dead, a spirit, a genie. I knew of him well before reading his books. I knew him well before being impressed by his immense literary talent, his style, his depths, far before deciding I'd be his faithful servant, his friend, his tightrope walker, his lover, his poor Moroccan. My mother, Mbarka, knew of him. The woman, this woman from the back of beyond who never learned to read or write was in communion with him. Someone had spoken to her of this writer. It was she who wanted to bring me to visit his tomb for good luck. It was she who put me on the path to Jean Genet. I simply followed her advice, and today in Nejma, alongside other writers and photographers, I am celebrating this good and cruel man with the words of my mother, through her way of reinventing the rituals, overstepping the mark and the gods. So as Taya sanctifies Genet à la Marocaine, he seems to reappropriate and reinvent the words that Jean-Paul Sartre gave uh, in his consecration of Genet in 1952 in the imperious 600 page Saint Genet, an actor and martyr, an actor and, and martyr. Yet unlike Sartre, who entombed Genet as this radical existential hero, Taya's pilgrimage to Genet's actual tomb is imagined as a kind of communitarian birthright tour. Taya casts his Muslim mother in Christian communion with the pagan genie to, to cite David to, 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 to borrow David Bowie's phrasing of, of Jean Genie or, or Jean Genet. He imagines his parochial, uneducated, illiterate mother Mbaka leading the charge to this canonical cosmopolitan author. It seems like a kind of mythologized game of Chinese whispers where someone tells the mother, which she passes on to her son, Taya, who cross fertilizes this with writers and photographers throughout Morocco positions it as a literary cannonball in the Librairie des Colonnes, and then disseminates this across the Mediterranean. I wonder if Genet's liminal tomb in La Rache forms a kind of canvas on which the hybridity of the Mediterranean might speak, or even a canvas on which illiteracy or a different kind of alphabet might speak, a space where the elitist form of literature as a fixed and static object can be reborn as a site of orality, where the marginal tongues of these Moroccan mothers who are silenced or denigrated politically become allied with Genet's own highly political marginalization as a form of iconoclasm. Being put on the path de Jean Genet leads to the troubling of any kind of static or monolithic identity. Rather, the legacy the mother passes down to her, her son is to reinvent the rituals and overstep the mark and the gods, to deviate from those sacred and secular norms by which identity is determined. So against the odds then, this edition of Nejma positions itself as a kind of minority press that has a view to a much more hopeful, blurred north-south horizon. The text, I'll just go back to the image here. Um, <clears throat> the text um, stages, opens by staging a Muslim, a North African saint's day for Genet, where lights, tears, songs, texts, poems, images, and collages come together in search of what Simon Pierre Amelin and Adèle Taille call new breath. Now we might think of, 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 of Denis Provencher's brilliant term, the flexible accumulation of language here, where self-expression is tied to a kind of accrual of mixed cultural symbols. 
but I do wonder if there might be something more poetically hopeful about this new breath that comes with the reappropriation of narratives, authors, intellectual giants from mainland France. Perhaps, as Amelin tells us in his short story, Sidi Gini or Saint Genet, when faced with the inhospitable folklore that surrounds a name that he says is as lointain qu'étranger, as, as far away as it is foreign, as canonical if disruptive, um, or like the, the term Genet, then maybe the only way to hear those Moroccan voices is in the celebration of disrupting the written word, of chirographic practice itself, celebrating the kind of homophony and sound of language in a way that might honor cultural difference. Genet becomes genie in the mother's tongue. And Tyre says that this becomes a way of sort of remaining faithful to an Arabizing of a, of a French intellectual heritage, appropriating this writer by integrating him into her daily reality. So this idiolect sits, this, this new language sits in neither camp, it's neither just genie or jeune or, or jeune, but in the, this kind of inter interstice of, of knowing and switching between the two. I think it's interesting that, that Taya talks about knowing the correct pronunciation of a term like jeune, but deciding to transgress that in a way that kind of highlights the diasporic experience of receiving culture across this Mediterranean stretch. It's kind of interesting because C.D. Gini subtends a whole host of competing oppositions attuned to a maternal, fraternal, homosexual, familial, Arabic, French, illiterate, scholarly, daily Moroccan reality. Seems to me this channels Genet's own prismatic self-representation when in one of his famous texts from, uh, from the early 40s, he talks about how the solitude of prison gave him the freedom to be the hundred Jean Genet's glimpsed in a hundred passers-by. It seems when he sees himself scattered in a hundred passers-by, he identifies and disidentifies with this eternally changing network of nomadic relations. And then he forges himself in others, just as Tyre casts his own Moroccan family as dispersing and deterritorializing themselves into their experience of Genet's legend and using that as a kind of form of belonging to, uh, to, to a shared Francophone literary heritage. So I guess just conscious of time, let's travel back up to the coast then of the, of the Librairie des Colonnes and think about the first, one of the first contributions in Nejma by the Moroccan literary stalwart Tahar Benjaloun. And I wonder if we might conclude with his eerily, um, eerily kind of uh, presaging words in one of his novels from 1985, The Sand Child. And it seems to me that this echoes those migrations to Genet's tomb in search of new cultural alphabets. And he says, I'm not in Africa, but in a cemetery by the sea. I feel cold. I am caught by warm hands. They stroke my back. I guess whose they are. They're not mine. I'm in the middle of a mutation and going from myself to myself. I'm on my way, but I don't know when or where this journey will end. I suppose I wondered if migrating, if I just show the last picture of the tomb again, migrating to Genet's tomb, either in person or in prose, either in Arabic or in, uh, in illiterate uh, legend, if this migration provides a kind of refuge to several Moroccan writers who are on this kind of itinerant, non-teleological journey of self-discovery. And I think I'll probably end there um, for, for, for want of not spilling over too long. Um, I'm going to use this, this idea of migration, if I come back and pretend I can see and speak to you all in person, if I use this, uh, this idea of migration, perhaps I can catapult ourselves 
from North Africa to, to West Africa and, and introduce my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Bakary Sarr from uh, the Université Cheikh Anta de Diop in Dakar, who's a, who's a professor of Francophone literatures, I'm emphasizing the plural there, um, and cinema uh, in Senegal. And, and he's going to talk us through how French language publishing has dominated book and media production in Senegal since colonial times and, and listen to some of his perhaps optimism um, or insurgence or insurrection around how francophone editors are looking to not just navigate between the constraints of the colonial tongue and, and celebrating African indigenous languages, but using that to modify uh, learning uh, at school level um, so that languages like Wolof and Pula, so that that kind of mother tongue is wrenched free from the, uh, from the, from the language of the oppressor. So I'm going to, yes, thank you. Merci également par l'usage de la langue officielle, la langue française. Donc cette l'édition a été largement dominée par l'usage de la langue française, par l'écriture en langue française, et donc l'édition en langue française. Et ça, c'est un héritage colonial depuis les années 60, même on peut remonter au euh, Donc, les maisons d'édition qui euh, se sont fait remarquer euh, globalement au Sénégal euh, ont accentué leur euh, ligne euh, d'édition sur euh, les ouvrages en, en français. Alors, Parmi ces maisons, on peut citer bien sûr les NEA, les nouvelles éditions euh, africaines du Sénégal, euh, qui ont été pendant longtemps une maison d'édition de référence euh, euh, dans ce qui se publie euh, sur euh, la littérature, sur euh, la fiction, sur le roman, sur euh, les genres, la poésie et autres. Et donc, pendant très longtemps, ça a dominé. Euh, l'édition au Sénégal, les classiques sénégalais, qu que ce soit Amit Sofal, euh, que ce soit Nafisa Figalou, euh, que ce soit euh, euh, Mariam Abba, euh, ont tous été édités euh, en français. Si c'est valable pour le Sénégal, c'est valable également pour, pour la sous-région, pour l'espace francophone, euh, ça va jusqu'au Mali euh, et d'autres. Mais pour le cas du Sénégal, euh, je dois dire que euh, la langue française a continué naturellement à exercer son pouvoir non seulement dans les autres espaces, mais essentiellement dans le monde de l'édition. Et cela, un certain nombre de maisons d'édition en, en ont souffert d'une certaine manière, parce que autant euh, l'édition en langue française euh, intéresse beaucoup de une autre partie du public, le public lettré, que ce soit le public scolaire, le public universitaire, le public euh, commun euh, de manière générale. Euh, autant donc que ça intéresse ce public de tout est formé en français, autant aussi une bonne partie, en fait, une partie de la population sénégalaise, euh, qui est à majorité illettrée à un moment donné, euh, n'a pas pu accéder à cette édition en, en français. Donc, cela signifie qu'on peut parler d'une minorité, une minorité donc a profité de ce qui se euh, publie dans les maisons d'édition euh, pendant cette période. Et cela jusqu'au moment où euh, quelque chose s'est passé comme un déclic. Un déclic euh, euh, qui n'est pas venu directement euh, du monde littéraire, mais c'est venu des, des, des médias, euh, des autres médias, comme la radio comme la télévision, jusqu'au moment où on a senti que de plus en plus des, des émissions en, en, Wolof, en langue nationale commencent à envahir le monde des médias, la radio, la télévision, et que le public devenait de plus en plus, de plus, en plus large, s'intéressait de plus en plus à ces supports, et bien je pense que ce, ce système a influencé un peu, d'une certaine manière, un certain nombre d'initiatives qui ont été prises pour changer un petit peu le format de l'édition. L'édition en français était bien là, mais de plus en plus, un certain nombre de maisons d'édition se sont 
sont mises en place et ont voulu exploiter également les canaux de l'édition en langue nationale, euh, que ce soit en Wolof, que ce soit dans les autres langues. Cela signifie pas que euh, c'est un phénomène tout à fait nouveau. Ce n'est pas un phénomène nouveau parce que depuis, depuis très longtemps, il y a eu euh, des manuscrits, il y a eu une littérature en langue nationale, en langue nationale, mais en caractère, caractère AA. Euh, ça, on on l'oublie très souvent dans euh, ce qui se passe euh, en termes d'édition dans la sous-région. Il y a eu, il y a eu depuis très très longtemps, même bien avant, il euh, édition, une littérature en langue, en langue, euh, en langue nationale, mais en caractère art. Donc, cette édition a, a, a existé parallèlement euh, à l'édition française qui est venue, mais sans pour autant qu'il y ait un pouvoir de diffusion et une, une promotion aussi importante. C'est lié à l'histoire politique du Sénégal, euh, la langue officielle, c'est le français, les institutions aussi en français. Euh, donc, l'administration, c'est en français. Donc, cela a euh, créé un système parallèle avec un fort pouvoir de la langue inassise du français. Alors, jusqu'au moment où cet effet euh, média a commencé et un certain nombre de maisons d'édition se sont mises en place tout de suite, euh, entraînant quelque part, du point de vue des initiatives, certains écrivains, euh, je vais y revenir euh, peut-être dans quelques minutes, Certains écrivains ont décidé de prendre, euh, d'éditer, d'éditer euh, leurs livres en langue nationale en langue wallonne. Alors, ça c'est un. Deuxièmement, euh, ce qu'on peut également euh, dire du point de vue de, de l'espace éditorial, c'est qu'il y a un espace classique, les maisons d'édition classiques, les liens euh, armatants, euh, les maisons des éditions, il y a un autre espace où de nouvelles initiatives d'édition sont prises qui bousculent un petit peu euh, l'espace les, euh, occupé par les maisons d'édition classiques euh, en, langue, en langue. Alors, euh, donc, il y, a, il y a parmi les, les plus anciens, il y a les Léa, il y a euh, le CAEC, ce centre qui a été mis en place par Amir de Sofoil à l'époque, euh, qui s'appelle Centre d'innovation et d'échange culturel, qui se fait à la fois de culture mais également d'édition. Euh, ça, c'est une idée. Euh, il y a d'autres aussi euh, maisons d'édition qui sont francophones, euh, qui vivent de français et qui ont commencé à prendre du champ. Euh, c'est la maison d'édition euh, mise en place par euh, l'écrivain Amad de la Messal, la maison de la poésie internationale. Il y a également le Nègre International, qui est une maison d'édition dirigée par Elisha Mourou, qui est un écrivain. Donc, euh, ils se sont tout de suite investis, investis, ils ont dû renforcer un petit peu l'édition en langue euh, française, mais en exploitant également d'autres genres, la poésie, le théâtre. Euh, Jusqu'au moment où, donc, des initiatives, c'est le, le troisième élément, des initiatives venant d'écrivains décide de mettre en place ce de rompre avec les pratiques littéraires euh, et de commencer à écrire en langue wolof. L'initiative, une des premières initiatives, vient de l'écrivain, du romancier et dramaturge euh, Cher Alindao, qui avait décidé naturellement de euh, d'arrêter d'écrire en wolof, en, en français et de ne plus publier que en, de plus écrire qu'en qu 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 wolof. Cette initiative de euh, euh, Chef Alindao a été prolongée, renforcée par les nouvelles initiatives que l'écrivain Boubacar Boussidiop a pris, hein, euh, d'abord en se euh, mettant en place, en s'organisant avec l'écrivain Fadi Moussar, euh, en mettant en place la maison d'édition Gimsan, avec un, un, en collaboration avec euh, Mémoire d'Antrier et les éditions du monde. Et ensuite, Boris a décidé également de mettre en place une autre maison d'édition qui s'appelle Tédou, Tédou euh, qui s'occupe de traduire un certain nombre de classiques en Wolof. Euh, C'est là que la tragédie du roi Christophe a été traduite en Wolof euh, de ses vers. C'est là que ici longue lettre de euh, Mariam Oba a été traduite en Wolof. Et Boris, naturellement, a fait cette, cette brèche pour euh, commencer à promouvoir l'écriture en voilà. C'est là qu'il a écrit son roman, euh, Dom Golo, Les textes de la Gono. Et ces initiatives continuent de plus en plus ce qu'on peut faire pour 
faire pour me euh, résumer, de plus en plus, les initiatives en langue nationale, les initiatives en langue nationale euh, continuent de prendre du champ parce que le développement euh, de la pratique des langues nationales a pris du champ, a pris de l'ampleur. Il y a aussi des éditions papyristes qui sont gérées par euh, un, un, qui s'appelle euh, qui, qui s'occupe naturellement de, 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 de publier publier un certain nombre de manuscrits aussi bien en Wallop, dans Antula, dans les autres langues et qui exploite tout un autre système de, de distribution. Euh, la chaîne, la chaîne de distribution des livres classiques est, est, est rompue et c'est un autre système de distribution qui se met en place et qui permet naturellement de voir qu'il y a d'autres pentes, d'autres possibilités, d'autres initiatives qui viennent bousculer un petit peu le cadre classique de production, d'édition et de circulation des livres au And here we are back to back into our camera mode, live mode, to pick up with, I think probably to move at this point after that intervention from Senegal, to move towards some conversation, I think, with those who are with us online, if possible. So please feel free, those of you who are watching and listening. That's quite a lot to have listened to, I think. Um, we've been running for a while now. I think we've gone in quite a lot of different directions um, to think about. I love that idea of the of, of that uh, you know getting a copy of the NME would be like getting out of a tunnel. And I think that that whole idea of kind of being in a tunnel stuck within a set of constraints and then reaching a kind of like a space where actually things might, you know, open up a bit, might be possible to kind of move a bit laterally. So I think it would be really interesting if we could try and move a bit laterally between the different things that we've been talking about. Um, and that that in some ways seems like what the, the, the sort of material that we're trying to get at is, is really um, why it's really important is its possibility of kind of taking, of just deciding to take and move from one space into another space. Um, I, you know, I think it's, um, it's uh, you know, take the kind of the high criticism and move it into the space of music journalism, take the kind of elite cultural forms and move them into spaces of, of kind of, of semi-illiteracy and see them become alive again through that. And equally, I think in that, in the ideas as well that were, you know, the things that were being defended in the context of the occupation were very much about, you know, making this, making it speak as much as possible in the context of really, you know, sort of, um, uh, of, you know, of, of really exposed lives. So just speaking really kind of through complex forms, through complex poetic forms, with it, with, but with that idea of being able to say something that would actually have a real, you know, kind of demystifying, solidifying impact. Um, so those of you who are online, if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, if you have any reactions, please do put them into the chat box. Um, Q and uh, the Q&A mode is now uh, activated. If you want to request permission to speak, then that is, I think, technically possible. Um, uh, and I, um, uh, I, otherwise, I'm going. I can segue on with my, with my books from the Paris workshop. But I wonder if anybody has any kind of connecting comments at the moment. It's like John Smith wants to come in. Right, please, John Smith, I think I can hear you looking for permission to speak. Do I hear somebody asking for permission to speak? I'm not very good with this machine, I'm afraid. Moderation, one. Uh, Okay, here we go. So, so um, I hope people can hear me. I have a question from David Bohm to Eugene. How were NME's high culture interventions received and reacted to by its music readers? By its, uh, yeah, by its readers. Um, yeah, thanks, David. A uh, really good question. So, um, mixed reactions, really. Um, 
sometimes in kind of music scenes there's a kind of frustration with too much kind of intellectualization for very good reasons and um, the, the kind of the response of some readers will be sometimes just you know get back to the music enough with the kind of uh the ideas and the kind of um uh cultural grandstanding and bring it back to basics but i think that became part of a conservative reaction at the same time because i, I spoke a little bit about how the, the high point of this kind of writing was at the the post-punk enemy between 1978 and 1984 and uh, some of the writers I mentioned like uh, Paul Morgan and Ian Penman were particularly notorious for kind of these high culture references and interventions um, and some people found them really exciting but other people found them really alienating and I think we kind of need to think about why people found them alienating without just saying oh it's a conservative reaction or they weren't kind of scaling up to kind of brand ideas I think people feel left out for very understandable reasons that need to be kind of grappled with. Um, you know, to interrogate why there's this kind of cultural anxiety around difficult ideas. Um, and I think as academics, we're kind of conscious about this with students in the classroom that like when we do difficult texts, sometimes there's a frustration or a pushback. And sometimes it's not a question of um, capacity or anything like that. It's a question of having the confidence to be comfortable with not knowing, to, 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 to dwell with something that you don't really know that much about for a long time. Um, so what happens in music journalism, unfortunately, is there was a kind of a conservative backlash. There wasn't that much grappling with, with um, uh, the kind of the politics of high interventions. And instead what started happening is a kind of um, uh, a new model of kind of record reviews, which it would be the stars uh, rather than these kind of high philosophical interventions, you'd have just give us four stars for a record review, a kind of a, a, a pure quantification, which is really kind of rowing back against some of the more um, adventurous ideas. And maybe like all three of us can kind of link up on this, on the politics of how this works out for kind of publishing today. But I think one consequence of that has been kind of balkanization in certain ways, in the sense that music and cultural producers, especially with the internet, kind of go back sometimes their niche corners. There's a lot going on, a lot of possibilities to discover, but that wide open popular space where, you know, people from all kinds of backgrounds might come across one another around these ideas is sometimes reduced, um, especially in the UK where, you know, into the 90s and 2000s, there was increasing dominance of critical um, and kind of cultural production by people from wealthier backgrounds. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, to sum up kind of mixed reactions, but it's a, it's a difficult legacy, I think, to think about and, um, to, to figure out for today's kind of cultural production as well. Thanks, David. Um, so we have a follow-up question, in fact, from David there, does it offer any guidance on building bridges? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what kind of uh, what kind of building bridges he might be referring to, but I'm presuming building bridges between sort of maybe high culture and low culture. And in a sense, while I described uh, a sort of conservative backlash, there's been other more progressive build bridges built since. Um, if you think about, you know, being human, for example, that's one kind of positive story of building bridges. Like what we're doing right now is trying to communicate academic research with a wider audience or communicate kind of public facing ideas. And even what universities do now, um, you know, you have kind of, for example, we teach courses on cultural studies where uh, we might have serious interrogation of a Netflix TV series. Um, that kind of idea might be scorned 20 years ago. But now it's taken quite seriously to study pop culture and um, low culture in a, in a serious way. And I think that's one kind of maybe progressive legacy of this kind of postmodern breakdown of high culture and low culture, that there are spaces where where these sorts of bridges and connections are pursued um, in interesting sorts of ways. I can see Laura trying perhaps to come in on the permissions, but I'm not sure if I'm doing the right uh, move here. Let me see. Um, okay. 
So let's keep moving with, I, I can't see if there's another question appearing at the moment, but never mind. I'm going to jump in and, um, and say perhaps other people can see on the platform and help the questions move forward. If there are other questions there or people want to speak, uh, please keep you know, putting them through the, the, the stream, basically. But I want to jump off what, what, what Eugene's saying in a way to kind of speak a little bit about the idea of making books in a very artisanal way. And I'm just going to show the last slide that I have here. I think it's the last one. Uh, we're going to move through the ends of that. So these are scenes of bookmaking. I'm just going to move us as well towards thinking about what this kind of configuration of different uh, interventions that we've had this evening can kind of how they can talk to one another, I think, through this project as well. And for me, it's certainly really uh, like kind of fascinating to try and put these different types of materials and these different spaces together. And this is very much a kind of a final small section on situations of migration where we're very much kind of picking up on the sorts of um, uh, situations, let's say, that Joanne was evoking in particular of Mediterranean crossings, of movements between literacy and illiteracy, of movements between oral tongue, oral language, oral practice and written practice, um, between spaces of high culture, because this is a situation that's taking place in a public library that's full of uh, an effort to transmit and share with a broad public base um, the kind of the works, a kind of a good selection of relatively high cultural works and also means towards high culture and literate, literate culture through lots of language learning opportunities. Um, you know, kind of driven by the, uh, the, the mission of a public library to enable people to access literate culture. And, um, so in this space, this project has taken, taken up, which is this collection, which is called Numé Messérien. And I want to just take a minute to kind of narrate where this strange word, numimisérien, came from. It's a word that was offered to us as a kind of, as a, as a, as a, as a possible, um, title for these collection of different books, some of which are extremely rudimentary, personal, one page, uh, narration or description of, um, you know, attachments. Uh, you can see some of the books here. Sometimes there, there's, there's a lot around animals and natural environments and, um, and stories and kind of recollections of other spaces in the world. And they're, they're made with a complete openness to, you know, the, 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 the content is completely uh, open to the individual who decides to set to and make a book, as you can see here. Um, sometimes using kind of interface with internet technology, sometimes really just drawing from the imagination, sometimes drawing from the immediate environment of a Paris street, um, and sometimes from a remembered environment of a completely different geographical area. And this this title, Numé Messérien, for me was is a, is a really interesting kind of offering of this kind of somewhere between uh, literate, illiterate offering, which was then translated as meaning that it is really important Il ne faut pas négliger les petites choses. Um, so this very kind of confident sense of it having a kind of proverbial value while having this very strangely uh, composite form, numé me c'est rien. Um, so this was a kind of instituted title. We, 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 we set it down as a collective uh, around which to work towards. And, um, and I think it speaks a little bit to some of these sorts of possibilities that we have of um, if we if we choose to take seriously these very modest acts of building something that can actually really speak volumes about the sorts of experiences that people have and enable us to kind of build the means of speaking to one another across these extraordinary differences of language, experience, relationship to culture, relationship to forms of permanence as well. So these are the kind of the books that underpin this desire to bring the high literary culture of a, um, of a uh, you know of a literary review to the music journalism of popular culture with that idea of the kind of you know the the the, um, the the desire for the new all the time and the, the you know the desire for the the, the kind of the, the excitement of culture and at the same time this uh, this kind of hybridity at the frontier between literacy and illiteracy. Um, uh, okay, so I'm gonna stop and come back to the camera. I'm also seeing a very um, long and lovely question from Laura, and it's lovely to see you again, Laura. Uh, not to see you exactly, but to read you. 
Laura, who graduated in 2018, and lovely to be back in ULIP in some capacity, and asking whether or not the idea of writers losing their language during the occupation and how they had to refine their language and their voice, and in trying to refine their language, did any new non-standardized modes of expression emerge in their work, or was it simply a mission of refinding their language again? Well, I think that's, yeah, that, Laura, your question is very brilliantly enabling me to make the connection with with the this idea of the hybridity because certainly i think some of the the really important texts that were written were written at, at that frontier between uh, a, a very um a, you know a very sort of um a very damaged language so that uh, this very damaged language that needed to be remade and if i give a kind of a, con a concrete example of that one of the uh, very fragile forms that was used in the very in the early years of the occupation were these tiny kind of small bits of writing that would be left on cafe tables, and which were completely cryptic, in fact, which were kind of kind of completely and necessarily cryptic. And it was as if the only kind of the only mode of speaking in clear ways would have to have been in complicity with the regime. Therefore, the need to write and express something that was in opposition to that dominant regime of the censoring occupying forces required uh, a passage through a very strangely cryptic form and i think that strangely cryptic very reduced very fragile form definitely uh set language off again in a much more you know set language off in the wake of the war towards a um a, a kind of an obstreperous a difficult a kind of you know an unwillingly uh unwillingly um dense kind of uh, modality so yeah so definitely i think a lot of examples in that respect of a of a, a a language that was damaged by its affirmativeness that therefore needed in some way to be remade in a different sort of um uh, obstreperous or uh, kind of unwilling mode I don't know if Joanne wants to add something to that. Journey would be an obvious place to go in, a, in that respect. Sorry, I was on. I was on mute there. Absolutely, and 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 I think this idea of um, that, that you were making here of, of in some ways reclaiming ah uh, kind of barbed and difficult kind of voices as a form of, of resistance um, and writing against uh, writing against kind of uh, the establishment writing against language as comprehension is definitely something that that Janae would have would have uh, would have very much celebrated I think um the, the quotation I gave during the presentation about um Genet's resistance to, to France as, as more than hating France, but wanting to vomit France out, a, a way of kind of internalizing um, the uh, the enemy, the national enemy, and in some ways evacuating it through uh, through all kinds of means is a really is a really kind of a brutal and violent form of, of disruption in language that I think is actually incredibly productive at the same time as it is as disruptive. Um, yeah. I can see on the chat that Laura, you asked a question about French literature in, in Senegal as, as well. I don't know if that would be a, 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 a so should I read that out? So, uh, this makes you think of the place of French literature in Senegal. Was literature written in French in Senegal because French was seen as a prestigious language or some processes of internalizing colonial superiority? Or have there been cases of authors in Senegal writing in French as a means of reclaiming the once colonial language, putting their cultural mark on it and thus deterritorializing de it? Has French literature from Senegal been seen as a process of decolonization as it ha has in other colonized spaces? Um, I wonder if perhaps I could jump in and sort of maybe make a few comments there and perhaps, perhaps if others you want to as well. Laura, I think that's a really interesting question. I think it's certainly certainly a kind of problem that we see in, in all desire for kind of decolonizing one's voice. Um, the case in Senegal, it's not dissimilar to the kinds of, uh, to the kinds of forms of revolutionizing and pastiching language that I mentioned in North Africa. Um, 
Speaking through the colonial tongue is to maintain and to insist on the same kinds of uh, hierarchies of domination that continually um, that continually uh, victimize uh, and continually oppress. Uh, those colonized peoples and certainly in Senegal there is a drive to honor and celebrate indigenous languages like Wolof and Pula precisely because those are the languages that are form part of an oral culture an oral culture that is in itself a kind of resistance to that chirography, to that practice of written language that makes literature this kind of fixed and static object that's only available to the elite. And so in some ways, when you talk about this idea of kind of appropriating the kind of colonial tongue, which we might argue that, that what's, is what Abdelatay is trying to do in this way of kind of appropriating and pastiching the tongue and mixing different forms of languages within French to create this kind of literary creole. I think in Senegal, what, what Bakary was talking about is much more, um, much more insurgent than that kind of hybridity. There is a desire to stop speaking through the language of the colonizer and start to celebrate a kind of literacy that might be passed on through oral narratives, that might be passed around through kind of oral cultures that are themselves rooted in a kind of illiteracy. So I would argue that perhaps in Senegal, the situation currently, and it's a really interesting one, is that um, as Becquerie was describing, the movement toward Wolof and Pula, the movement toward these indigenous languages and their dissemination is not happening in literature. Literature is only still being considered to be the, the object um, of the elite that is in some way untouchable, that what belongs to a kind of space and time uh, that becomes a kind of hallmark or, or a, a stamp, if you like, of intellectual prowess and somehow the ways in which we might uh, we might do violence to those kinds of colonial dynamics is not going to be passed through French literature in this kind of canonical sense, in a sort of even in translation, there's still a gest there's still a kind of timeline that's problematic there that they, you know has to be translated in the first place, suggests that there is in some way um, you're still having to undo these these colonial heritages, but that actually that it's through radio, through the transmission of oral cultures, that we are hearing new forms of learning and thought and culture that have once been sidelined as illiterate and therefore impossible in many ways to pass on. So I think in Senegal, the situation is quite different to this kind of hybridity I was talking about in North Africa. Um, and I think in Senegal, what Bakary was talking about is that as ever, publishing houses need to make money. And unfortunately, the big publishing houses like Armaton uh, have a francophone readership rather than necessarily a readership in Wolof and in Pula. And it's actually at school where we need to be kind of making these strides to, to insist on a kind of decolonization. I think you made some really brilliant points there, Joanna. I just think just like to kind of uh, within what Becca was saying and what we put over and the words over the over the film, so it was a little bit clear for people to read. One of the things, one of the cases I think that's really fascinating is that translation of Mariam Abbas, who wrote so a Senegalese woman writer denouncing forms of violence against women um, in a really important text, in si longue lettre, which has become a kind of classic of Sub-Saharan Francophone literature taught very frequently in you know, university departments, particularly in the US. And that translating that back, as she's a Wolof speaker, into Wolof, but also in, in collaboration with two publishing houses that are you know, transnational in, in, in Canada, in Montreal and in France. So there's a very strange kind of like intersecting kind of temporalities here between a use of Wolof as an oral oral kind of mode of transmission, as Joanne's saying, through the radio, through TV, which Becca was pointing out as well, through audio, um, also very much relayed through mobile phones versus, uh, versus this kind of transnational, much more stable production of an elite culture, which is now happening in you know, um, non-European languages. But that kind of, those happening very different sort of like with very different temporalities, I think, in terms of the speed of dissemination and where these this culture is disseminating. 
But at the same time, a small frontier, which might be the university classroom in Dakar, which is precisely the reason for speaking to people like Bekai. I think, and I, I think there are spaces of a junction between that kind of audio and literary culture, which is, again, I think a space that I identify with in terms of the public library, where there is that space of the book and the stability of the book culture interfacing very much with the speed of audio and oral culture. Um, and the music magazine is a great example and that idea of the dwelling, you know, the kind of the sort of that the, the, the semi inertia that a magazine introduces into the production of, of popular culture, which I think is a is an interesting way of thinking about the material that you were discussing, Eugene. Yeah, I might jump off that point if there's no more questions at the moment, just that. Um... I guess one way of thinking about this is the idea of like imagined communities that Benedict Anderson spoke about in relationship to nationalism. And um, the idea being that like nationalism in the beginning was a form of imagined community facilitated by Prince capitalism and the rise of technological capitalism and Prince culture in particular, which kind of went about the process of standardizing language in all with all its kind of destructive consequences that you were referencing, Joanne. Um, but that kind of standardization in the beginning was kind of thought about as facilitating uh, communities with people you don't know, you know, communities spread out about large or uh, kind of uh, across larger spaces, like the idea of reading a morning newspaper uh, is an act of participating in a kind of imagined community with, you know, you don't know how many people make up the nation in which you live, you don't know anything about them, but this kind of action makes you complicit uh, this kind of ritualistic performance in the idea of an imagined community and that's kind of been one way that um mark sinker one of the historians of the kind of tradition of music journalism and um, one way he's theorized uh, this kind of print culture it's kind of like a, a counter-cultural imagined community that tries to work a little bit against the destructive processes of um standardization you're referencing and kind of think uh, of of these subcultures in a more fluid way that you were referencing, Anna Louise. Um, and you know, kind of, you spoke a little bit about um, like the necessary encryption of publishing under wartime or publishing under occupation. Um, and that's something I really like to think about in kind of subcultures as well the necessary encryption. It's what makes people feel kind of alienated. But by definition, any kind of subculture has to kind of define itself by a process of initiation and learning new languages or kind of cross-cultural fertilization that's kind of painful and annoying at the beginning, but gives birth to interesting new connections at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, and relatedly, um, Sinker, who I mentioned, also talks about that tradition. He says that, like, the birth of it, it, it took place in Britain at the, the moments of the end of empire. So he kind of talks about it as like a counter colony at the very moments of the end of the British Empire with its colonies kind of in decline. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's just one way I've thought about it, like this idea of like a countercultural imagined community. Um, it's maybe kind of one kind of source of connection between the sort of different scenes we were trying to stitch together. Go ahead, Joanne. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to jump in on that. I think what's really What's really interesting though is when you invert that idea, because I think I think one of the difficulties, if you like, of the of the transmission of indigenous languages and indigenous literatures is precisely that there is no desire for us this to be a subculture. On the contrary, that there is this, the desire to actually to actually instate this as a kind of as an authority as such. And I think in many ways the problem is that the translation itself is a kind of in part a kind of colonizing act or a memory if you like or a trace precisely of the kind of the colonial violence that erased and silenced those indigenous languages in the first place so i think it's really curious this idea of the imagined communities you describe because one of the senses that i i'm getting in, in the desire to reappropriate certain uh colonial ideas and and intellectual frameworks is to actually reassert the hegemony 
and the authority of the individual rather than precisely to kind of flatten them in these communities that then kind of bundle them away into certain pockets that allow them become, to become almost fetishized as, as those who read Maryam Abba's Wolof translation versus the majority. So again, I think it's this push and pull that we're always seeing. And I think this is what, what Taya's doing is very interesting of the gesture of reappropriation and pastiching and ventriloquizing in order to completely rewrite and reassert his voice as a new authority, not to, to kind of um, resist that colonial tongue in a really brittle way of saying this now has to be Arabic because I learned Arabic and I never spoke French. French was the kind of the language of the elite. And, and it was insisted as such by Moroccans who would only speak in that way in the kind of 19th century Russians would speak French in a, a kind of gesture of elitism. Rather than to kind of uh, think of this in a sort of binary dynamic, actually, I think the, the hybridity is what becomes, and the this creole is what becomes politically really interesting to kind of assert the equality and individuality of these voices who are constantly being hidden by huge capitalist print presses that 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 see no financial gain in their stories. So I, I think the subculture idea is once again the kind of potentially the language of those who dominate. Maybe it's not necessarily the the journey for those who seek who seek an individual um, influence or an individual kind of imprint so if we talk about this language of footprints and imprints i think perhaps yeah that's i just that was just a remark mm. yeah okay there's a question from david again about jargon including and excluding i think that's an interesting one to think about jargon in relation to what we've just been saying about um, you know, languages that are disruptive, languages that don't want to particularly stay in place, that are not necessary. You know, jargon in itself is a very, it's a very pejorative term that suggests pl placing an obstacle between yourself and the reader. And I think that kind of that idea of placing an obstacle, but as something to kind of go towards as something that is actually, you know, whether, whether the, the difficulty is what makes it, um, an exciting prospect. It's what makes it a, a sort of transformative prospect. So perhaps it's kind of interesting to think about whether or not jargon um, can also contain that space of exploration within language. Um, but Eugene, perhaps you want to come back with a, an answer to David there. Yeah, sure. I mean, I agree with those points and think it is true that like jargon both includes and excludes and in, like in a sense, obviously that's true, I suppose, of, of any kind of language to an extent or any kind of linguistic community. Um, but I kind of think of uh, Aimé Césaire, um, in particular Césaire's rewriting of Shakespeare's The Tempest, where the character of Caliban is, you know, in that rewriting, um, the fact that it, refusing to speak Prospero's language, refusing to speak the language of the European colonizer, is embraced as a kind of anti-colonial weapon. Um, and this is something I think that's quite present in some of the kind of countercultural writings I referenced, um, especially in the idea of Afrofuturism, this idea of a kind of, you know, free jazz, uh, science fiction in African and American music, taking these encoded murky languages and using them as kind of almost, in a sense, uh, anti-colonial kind of um, intellectual weapons, if you like. Uh, this really comes out then in the writing of Kojo Eshin, who's got this book, um, More Brilliance in the Sun, Adventures in Sonic Fiction. Uh, he's an academic at the moment at Goldsmiths, and he wrote for The Wire quite a bit in the 90s. And his for, that book is something that takes those ideas from Césaire, but also Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic, um, and mixes them with his own kind of jargon. Uh, he uses a lot of kind of portmanteau and invented concepts. Um, because he kind of situates himself as someone who was a journalist, but someone who wants to produce concepts and wants to introduce ideas that might be initially incomprehensible to some readers, but um, that also invite a certain kind of initiation, if you like. And so I think maybe the inclusive aspect of jargon might be the idea that maybe where all these where all this kind of thinking on jargon and kind of encryption uh, from anti-colonial colonial writing is going towards is to link up with some of the points Joanna was making about decolonization, 
which is to say that yes, while jargonistic writing is kind of exclusive initially, um, maybe in its more progressive usages, it's trying to decouple knowledge and complex ideas from uh, uh, property relations, which is to say that the jargon doesn't really belong to anyone. That maybe those people who are from kind of colonial backgrounds and kind of who suffered racism and the after effects of kind of slavery and racial capitalism have a privileged access to it, but invite uh, other complicity, invite a kind of shared understanding that is not about, you know, an exclusive ownership over jargonistic language or interesting um, adventurous ideas. Um, yeah, that's kind of a, a bit of a tangent, but uh, <laughs> no, I think that's really. I think you've made your point really, like, brilliantly, really forcefully as well. That idea that there would be the possibility, not just of a kind of a face-off across uh, ownership of the cultural field, but actually of really kind of creating other spaces. And I suppose that brings us back at some level to this idea of the new worlds that we're interested in. This idea that there would actually be an opening up of a new space through this develop this kind of this this taking heist over this kind of adopting taking resting away from the spaces of power of potentially powerful forms and bringing them and making them making them sit alongside less powerful forms in in spaces of marginalization but work within those spaces really effectively so i think that you know uh, I think that does bring us back to what it does mean to kind of open up new worlds. Um, and on that, since we have no more questions and we've been running for quite a while, we've been running for basically an hour and a half, which is about the right length of time. What we're going to do to close this is take ourselves back to, in fact, to Cameroon with a very short sequence from a film, which is a really great film that deals with some of these questions really directly, which is called Afrique, je te plumerai, which is a good, which is a little quotation from a, a very common French ditty, which is a kind of a way of, you know, it's a childhood nursery rhyme that becomes a much more kind of powerful sentence in this, in the context of this film. I will fleece you. I will, you know, and um, and I think it's that that's a, in itself as the title for this film. It's made by a filmmaker from Cameroon, a Franco-Cameroonian filmmaker called Jean Marie Tino. We're just going to be showing a very short extract to see us out of this event. Um, it's a it's a it's a very good example, I think, of how there are um, resources, if you like, within the dominant forms that can actually be turned towards other spaces. Um, but the, the little extract that we're going to be showing you and we'll close the event on that. So I'm going to say my thanks now to everybody who supported this, the Being Human um, Festival in particular. And if possible, we will now put up the um, the survey for you to fill in. If you will, uh, very would be very grateful if you would take the time to fill in the survey if you've enjoyed the event. Um, and then uh, to so to thank the Being Human Festival, to thank Eric Erdel on the technical side of things. My thanks enormously to my colleagues Eugene and Joanne for joining me on this. It's been really interesting to listen to you. Um, so I think what we're going to do is run the film, and there we uh, and then um, and say goodbye before before I set it going. Okay, so hopefully I can do this. And it is going to be that, and it's going to be that. Le thème ne fut chorale et le sultan Joya, dont le palais me paraissait bien plus beau que celui des Maharajas des films indiens. Il fut un grand souverain et un grand inventeur. Il inventa un moulin à maïs très élaboré et surtout une écriture en 1885. En 1895, il arriva à la forme définitive de cette écriture. Cela se passait avant l'arrivée des Blancs à Fumban. Il paraît que cette écriture lui fut révélée. Nous savons qu'il lui le roi eu un rêve. Un homme s'est présenté à lui en rêve et lui a demandé de prendre une planchette et de dessiner une main d'homme de laver ce dessin et de voir ce qui a servi à ce lavage. Voilà les recommandations que le roi a reçues du rêve. Immédiatement, il a fait cela. Le lendemain, donc, 
le roi a encore fait tout ce qui lui avait été indiqué par le maire et a convoqué une réunion de ses états. À la réunion, il leur a dit bien voilà, si vous partez chacun faire un dessin que vous nommez, je ferai de ce dessin une écriture. Les notables n'ont pas cru, mais il leur a imposé cela. Ils sont partis au bout de trois jours, chacun est venu avec un dessin. Le roi a réuni ses dessins pour former son premier alphabet, composé de 500 dessins. Et les signes ici étaient des pictogrammes. Chaque signe représentait un mot, voire même une phrase. Un exemple de ces signes, nous avons peut-être ce signe qui se lit Ngam et qui est égal à Arény. Bon, par la suite, le roi s'est rendu compte que les 510 signes étaient nombreux et venus à médiser par son peu. Il a donc entrepris de réduire et de simplifier cet alphabet. Et par six simplifications, il a enfin obtenu un alphabet composé de 70 signes que nous utilisons actuellement. Et ces 70 signes maintenant sont des phonèmes. Donc, il est parti du stade des pictogrammes au stade du phonème. Comment s'est passé dans la simplification Si nous simplifions, vous n'est-ce pas le signe gamme Voilà ce qu'il a fait. Il commence par effacer, il efface, il réduit ainsi. Enfin, il fait ceci pour obtenir enfin ce signe qui, au lieu d'être le mot gamme, devient plutôt syllabe nga. Voilà donc comment s'est passée la simplification. Nous avons donc les 70 signes de l'alphabet que nous utilisons actuellement pour écrire. Et je me suis servi donc de ces 70 signes pour écrire « liberté » en français et « délimène » en « chumon » et « chouto » en « chupanel ».